grateful for God's provision for us. Uh, we are, I have been asked to talk for a while. I said, I don't know if I can do that. I, 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 I just don't know that I can. So anyway, uh, we're having some technical difficulties. And so um, as I was reading the word this morning, I was reminded of how Paul was addressing the various churches. And it was always a, an encouraging word in how he was praying for those, those churches. Addressing the saints. He never said, hey, congregants, anything like that. He always addressed it as saints, the saints, the saints at Ephesus, the saints at, at Corinth. So the saints at Legacy. His prayer was, may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone. I know I lack some love at times. The Lord, the, Paul's asking that the Lord would bless us with an overflowing love. Just as we also do for you, as our love overflows to you, for you. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Amen. So I ask that the Lord would gr grant that for us this morning, that our hearts would be overflowing with love for one another. Now, Amen. that's not always something that you think, well, I can't do that. I don't even know that person. Well, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can show God's love to that person. Gentlemen, how are we doing back there? We're ready for songs? We are? Okay, well, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, we can't go yet. So, one of the things that we want to remember is that God is constantly working within our hearts. Are we yielding to that work? Are we really yielding to that work? Or do we, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm retired now. I don't really have to worry about things. Or, you know, I don't, I'm doing good. But God wants to exhibit his love overflow through us to those around us. So wherever you work, wherever you are, your family members, all of those, that, those are the recipients of the love that he wants to pour out through you. Well, I don't, really don't like my brother. I can't do that. Well, see, that's, that's the, the beauty of God's mercy on us, that it's new every morning. When we fail one day, the next day it's, it's brand new. We start again, and he can use us that day if we yield our hearts to, to him to be used. Do you always feel like you want to be used by God? Mm, most of the time. But his joy fills our heart when we're obedient to him. And that means we're, again, we're laying down our life to testify of him and his love and his faithfulness to us. So isn't that a reason to give him some, some praise? Amen. How about we stand? I've talked long enough. I think I stalled it long enough. They got the job done back there. But I really want you to just, let's think about this. What's going on right now in heaven? Holy, 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 holy is being sung to the Father. Holy, holy, holy. Do those words ever come out of your mouth daily? Holy, holy. I'd have to say that habit is not necessarily always on my lips that I'm saying holy, holy, holy. But we can make habits that are going to be beneficial for building us up in the, in the Lord, but also for glorifying Him in the process. Amen? So we can create a habit. And one habit is just honoring Him with our lips. Holy, holy, holy. Let's just say that right now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Now just close your eyes. and Maybe lift your hands. Lift your hands. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Now let's just start to sing that. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. 
boy, you feel like you're fish out of water, don't you? You know, that's because we have to train that habit. Train that habit to sing unto the Lord. Train that habit. Train your body, train your mind to sing unto the Lord. So as we begin the song service, let's just dedicate it to the Lord. Father, we give you this time. Have your way with us. Have your way with us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. We don't have to come to God like somebody else. We come to him like we are. And a lot of times that... Uh, extended teaching on all kind of things with uh, I'm leaving and, and uh, this was the night before he was betrayed and, and uh, instructions about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says this, I have said these things to you, all that he has taught them. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Those are good words. That is a great promise. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We recognize the first part of, of your statement, Jesus. We understand that in the world we'll have trouble. Sometimes we wrestle with the fact that you have overcome the world. Lord, may we, as we look to that truth this morning, may we take heart, knowing, knowing that you have overcome the world. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. First century believers struggled greatly uh, with, to persevere through hardships. So it is today, right? Believers in Christ struggling to, to persevere through the difficult things of life. And so we come to the book of James. First one, a deal before we jump into the book. We're going to look at the first uh, four verses of, of James chapter 1. James, very common name. There was four, maybe five Jameses in the New Testament. Two or three of them can be uh, eliminated pretty simply. Most scholars believe that the James who wrote the, the letter or the book, we call it, that bears his name, was indeed the half-brother of Jesus. James, the half-brother of Jesus. And when Jesus' siblings are mentioned, James is mentioned on top. He's probably uh, next oldest or the oldest of Jesus' siblings. Obviously, Jesus was the oldest because Mary had never had a child before she had Jesus, right? Then Mary and Joseph had other children. Uh, we believe James probably is the oldest uh, of their kids. And I think there's a very good reason to believe that James, who wrote the book of James that we're going to begin to study together, is none other than the brother of our Lord. We're told that he was a skeptic during the ministry of Jesus, his brother. In John chapter 7, verse 5, it said even his brothers didn't believe in him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a sibling of Jesus? Uh, my, he could tell some stories. Interesting, though. Interesting. James doesn't throw his weight around. J James could drop the name above every name. Hey, I'm Jesus' brother. He never does that. James seems to be humble enough. Perhaps he recognized, perhaps James recognized that, yeah, it took me quite a while to embrace the lordship of my brother. After the resurrection, James is included in those who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Again, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, James is mentioned amongst those who have put their faith, put their trust in Jesus. And this James would go on to be a leader in the church, a leader in the church of Jerusalem. Uh, when we studied through the book of Acts, if you remember, chapter 15, James was kind of in charge of that gathering together of church leaders from all over who tried to figure out what do we do with Gentiles, non-Jewish people who come to Christ? What should we make them do? Eusebius, uh, 
uh, his church historian and, and prolific writer in the uh, year 300-ish said this about James. James spent so much time in prayer that his knees were like those of a camel. Now, I don't know, and that's become a famous quote. Uh, don't know if Eusebius uh, really believed that James was old camel knees, but his point is, Right, his point is that James was a man of prayer. James was martyred, we believe, around the year 62. So this was probably written around in the, in the 50s, maybe mid-50s, when Paul was traveling, when Paul was beginning to write, probably at the early end of Paul's writing of his letters, just to give us some, some context. In the middle of what we have now is the book of Acts. May I say, as we start this, what a blessing. What a blessing to study a letter that was written by the brother of Jesus. Yes, all scriptures inspired. We cherish the letters of Paul. We cherish the letters of John. We cherish the gospel accounts. But is there not something a little bit special about a letter written by the Lord's own brother? Well, the book of James has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Just very, very practical. It just sort of hops around uh, those Bible teachers who just kind of can't stay on one track. L probably love the book of James. He just goes from one thing to another, and he just, oh, hey, what about this, and what about this? Uh, very practical. Not necessarily organized like Paul would write his letters. 54 imperatives in the book of, of James. Do this -es and don't do that -es. Right, imperatives, do this, don't do that. <clears throat> Certainly, his letter is less relational than Paul's. Paul would spend some time, hey, how you doing? I hope to see you soon, if he hadn't already. And uh, let me tell you about my travels, and may I ask you to pray for me. Right, Paul adds a lot of personal content. James, nada. He just jumps right in it and just starts uh, sharing his heart. And perhaps the, the theme of the book of James, and maybe James's heart, as he, as he really doesn't exchange a lot of pleasantries, and again, we don't know the dynamic there. He could have dropped his brother's name. He didn't, or his clout with Jesus. But perhaps James' focus is something like this. The faith that we pro profess must be demonstrated in every circumstance of life. The faith that we profess. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's filled me with his spirit. I believe I've been born again from above. The faith that we profess must be demonstrated in every circumstance, every area, every situation in our lives. And we see that throughout the book of James. Unlike Acts that we just got done studying for two years almost, a year and a half, um, James just deals with little chunks and and uh, we'll, see, we'll see how long this, this study takes, but I trust that it will be a blessing to us. James, James would say, I think maturity would say, and where we're going with this message this morning, maturity would say, hardships in life should not be seen as hindrances. Hardships in life should be seen as opportunities. Opportunities to grow our faith, opportunities to grow our trust in God. The hindrances of this life, the troubles of life, should not be seen as hindrances, but opportunities. Do you remember the words of Jesus? In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So here we go. Let's jump into the first four verses of the book of James. James chapter 1, look at the first four verses. Number one, we're going to look at the certainty, the certainty of trials. The certainty of trials. And let's just look at the first verse. James gets it started. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Footnote, that's my brother. Um, no, he didn't say that. To the 12, 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. The certainty of trials. James is writing to 12, what he calls the 12 tribes of the dispersion. What's all that about? Well, probably refers to what we read in Acts chapter 11, verse 29 excuse me, 19, uh, where it says that the, 
because the persecution was building up after Stephen's martyrdom. In chapter 8, uh, persecution was ramping up and believers were being scattered, especially Jewish believers were being scattered after Stephen's persecution. So he's writing to believers, probably largely Jewish, outside of Palestine, part of the dispersion or the, the chasing them out. They were being dispersed through other regions. And no doubt they were people who were frightened, people who were discouraged, people who were confused, because Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rise again, which he did, and I'm going to ascend, and I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and to indwell those of you who trust in me. And they're probably thinking, well, then everything's going to be okay, right? We still kind of think that, don't we? Well, if God's in charge, isn't everything going to be okay? Surely things are going to be fine, and all of a sudden, now, some years later, they're finding that you know what? Things have gotten worse. What is up with that? James is writing to folks like you and I who say, isn't God in charge? Aren't the promises of God true, trustworthy? And he's writing to believers who are, who are probably a bit discouraged and a good bit confused. There's economic turmoil. There's political turmoil throughout the region. Persecution is on the rise. Again, they're probably wondering, what's up with this? And believers are being threatened on every side. I want to suggest to us this morning a couple, a couple of areas, a couple of truths about the certainty of trials that, that James is going to go on and, and mention in these first few verses. First, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. I don't know if you've noticed that. Third chapter in the Bible, right? First two chapters, everything's hunky-dory. It's a theological term that means... God said everything was good. He's creating stuff, and, and, and his creation is walking with him and hearing from him, hearing his voice, knowing his presence, two chapters, and the third chapter of the Bible. The tempter comes, tempts Adam and Eve. They say, he says, why do you believe God? Just go ahead and, and eat one commandment. Don't eat of the fruit that's from the tree in the middle of the garden. One commandment. And the tempter came, and, and uh, you know, God's just lying to you. He's pulling your chain. Why don't you just, and they, they fell, right? 1,189 chapters in the Bible. The first two, it's all good. The next 1,186 chapters, damage control. All the rest of the Bible, okay, we live now in a fallen world. We, we're, we're, our sin has separated us from God. Sin has entered into the whole human race. And we've been separated from God. And the, the last 1,186 chapters of the Bible are really spiritual damage control. How then can God be approached if, if we are sinful and he is holy? The fall of man changed everything. And that's the understatement of the day, I think. The fall of man changed everything. Paul writes in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that sin came through one man, Adam, and sin spread into the whole human race, for all have sinned. Sin has affected all of us. All men, for all time, have been affected by sin. We say, well, I, I wasn't Adam. I didn't do that. Sin has entered in. We have all rebelled, right? We have all rebelled against God. And we live in a fallen condition. Romans chapter 1 says the wrath of God is poured out on, on men's disobedience who, who know the truth but refuse to accept the truth and they worship the created things rather than the creator and, and things are not the way they're supposed to be, right? So we, we treat others different. We think about others in a way that is not supposed to be, right? We live in a fallen world. Not in a world, well, there's, there's a few imperfections. You know, God knows we're human. That's very true, by the way. But we live in a fallen world. Not just a, a wonderful world that there's just a few problems. Perhaps the American dream is that idea, that ideal, that all of difficulty will be removed. And isn't that our hope? Isn't that our desire? Isn't that what every television commercials about buy this product and all your problems will disappear and you buy 10 of those
products, and you still got the same problems. Uh, religious ideals, right? Religious idealism says, oh, we can have heaven on earth and everything. No, we live in a fallen world. There will be heaven in heaven, but on earth, you will have trouble. You'll have tribulation. You'll have difficulties. But Jesus said he'd overcome the world. We live in a fallen world. That is one reason why trials are certain. And secondly, we should expect trials. We should expect difficulties. In this world, you will have tribulation. Jesus said that after he taught them much about uh, he's going to send his Holy Spirit to speak to you, to, to uh, empower you, to give you insight and direction. And yet he still said, in this world, you're going to have troubles. Um, it's not optional. It's not potential. It's real. You're going to have problems in this world. And James is going to go on and say we have various, various kinds of trials. There is self-inflicted trials. We're all pretty familiar with that, aren't we? From our own disobedience, self-inflicted trials, bringing stuff on ourselves. There's spiritual trials like persecution, temptation, persecution from without, temptation from within. Paul would, would write later in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape. Isn't that a way of saying what Jesus said? In the world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Don't be surprised at temptation. It's going to come. It's common to man. That thing that, thing that you struggle with and the devil tells you, Oh, you are, are you kidding me? You're the only Christian on the face of the earth that, that struggles with that. No, no. Uh, God says pretty clearly that there's no temptation that's come over me that is not common to man, right? Uh, we're all in the same boat. There's, there's self-inflicted trials. There's spiritual trials. There's mystery trials, I'll call them. Those things like, I don't even understand where this thing came from, right? You had any of those this week? Mystery trials. Like, why is this even happening? I don't understand. Redeemed people living in an unredeemed world, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have difficulty. Peter would say, 1 Peter 4, 12, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that's come upon you as if some strange thing were happening to you. Kind of the same, the same idea. The certainty of trials. We live in a fallen world. We should expect trials. Not if, if trials come, but when trials come. Sin has had untold effect on the human experience, right? It leads to difficulty, loss, disappointment, things that don't even make sense. So may I suggest a little pastoral advice here? Instead of obsessing over why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? Why aren't things different? Instead of obsessing on the why has this happened, why don't we obsess on why is God so good to me? Let's obsess on that. Well, God, why are you so good to me? Why would you pour your grace out on me? I kind of know my heart. God, you really know my heart. Why would you be so good to me? Maybe we ought to obsess on that, huh? Instead of obsessing on why does this or that happen? Which leads to our second point. Secondly, the attitudes toward trials. The attitudes toward trials. And there are many, many, many. I'm going to suggest three of them. Verse 2. Count it all joy. What? <coughs> Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That's crazy talk, isn't it? Count it. No, you're supposed to say no. That's, that's God's word. Yeah, that strikes us as crazy talk. Count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. What's up with that? The trials of various kinds, all kinds of things that plague us, all kinds of things that trouble us, uh, can be met with a variety of responses, a variety of attitudes. How do we respond? And here's the question. How do we respond? How do I respond to trials, difficulties of life? Well, Probably a whole box of ways that we, that we respond, right? Let's take a look at three of them. 
One, the attitude of blame. The attitude of blame. God is not caring. He's able. He's able to do something. He's able to fix everything, but he just, for some reason, chooses not to. He just doesn't care. He's able to do anything he wants, but for some reason, he chooses not to fix my thing. The, the thing that's troubling me, that difficulty that just keeps cropping up in my life. He's able, but he just doesn't care. It's his fault. We're reminded by the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that we serve a high priest, Jesus, talking about Jesus, who sympathizes with our weaknesses. Or your old King James says it this way, who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He is touched with the, pain, the things that pain us. Stop and think about that for a moment. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He sees the things that, that trouble us. He th sees the things that plague us. He sympathizes. He's touched. He is touched. His heart is touched with the things that bowl me over and bowl you over if you're a child of his. That's amazing grace, isn't it? Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. We can cast all of our anxieties or our cares upon him because he cares for us. We can cast all of our burdens, our cares, our anxieties on him because he cares for you. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33, uh, in, summing up in a few words, don't worry about, about food that you're going to eat. Don't worry about water to drink. Don't worry about clothes that you need to put on for your God knows and your God cares. He is able. Look at nature. He's, he takes care of nature. Aren't you more important than all of the rest of his created order? Paraphrasing what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. So we say, well, but God's not doing enough. Really? Really? You have breath in your lungs? I have breath in my lungs this day? And God's not doing enough? Attitude of blame. God, you can fix all this, but you must, for some reason, just choose not to want to. Perhaps you don't care. If you cared, you'd do something. Secondly, the attitude of doubt. The attitude of doubt. God is not strong. God is not powerful. He cares. Oh, he's so willing, but he's completely unable to do anything about the troubles of life. The attitude of doubt. He's unable. He's powerless to do anything. May we remind ourselves that he created all things. May we remind ourselves that he will restore one day all things. In the meantime, he is sovereign over all things. He is very capable of doing anything that he desires to do. The attitude of doubt. Well, he, probably, he probably cares about others, but he doesn't care about me. You ever wrestled with that? Yes, you have. Because we all have, right? God's fixing stuff in other people's lives. We only see the, the things that seem to be going well. We don't see all the broken stuff in somebody else's life, right? He probably cares about others. Uh, he just doesn't care about me. I've probably done something. I've probably done, done something so bad that God doesn't want to fix my stuff. The attitude of doubt. May we remind ourselves of, of Abraham. Uh, he had some bad days, right? Moses, he had a couple bad days, lost his temper more than one occasion. Oh, how about David? He was a train wreck there for a while, wasn't he? God seemed to pour out his grace on him. Samson, train wreck from beginning to end. God poured out his grace on him. How about the Apostle Paul? Murdered church folk. That was his, that was his job title. Go find church folk, have them drug into prison, maybe, maybe even kill a few of them to make your point. God poured out his grace on him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? May we remind ourselves that God, for the history of mankind, has been pouring out his grace on jacked up people. Oh, but, but God just does, I must have done something. What, are we some kind of special or something? Are we some kind of special something? God is willing to pour out his grace. God's willing to, to pour out his promises on all who call upon his name, right? That is a promise of God. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. 
the attitude of doubt. Could it be that God, the promises of God, are for all who call upon his name? Third, the attitude of faith. The attitude of faith. Well, now there's a novel idea. The attitude of blame. God could do something. He's just not willing. Attitude of doubt. Well, God's willing, but he's just not able. How about the attitude of faith, which looks something like this. God is God. God is good. Isaiah 59, God says through Isaiah in Isaiah 55, verse 9, uh, that, that God's ways are much higher than our ways. God's thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. So maybe we stop acting like we, we know it all and, oh, I know why this is happening because God doesn't care. Maybe we stop acting like we know it all and surrender to the one who is in control of it all, right? The attitude of faith. God, I don't understand. I don't understand why this is happening. Uh, loss of a loved one or a health issue, financial issue, whatever it might be. God, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand how that works, but God, I just want to trust I just want to trust in you. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God has already demonstrated his love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that not enough? Is that not enough that God would love me and you enough that he would give his son before we even had a chance to say thank you? Right? He demonstrated his love for us. Let's go back to that count it all joy thing, because I know you're just waiting for that thing. Count it all Consider it pure joy. I think some of your translations might say. Count it all joy. Understanding that the difficulties of this life point to eternal glory. That this is the, they, the difficulties of this life point to the fact that this is not our home, right? This is not our home. This is not the way things are supposed to be. But God is preparing for you, Christian, preparing for you a place where everything is the way it's supposed to be. Let me state the obvious. Nobody loves difficulty. If you do, you need counseling. No, nobody loves difficulty, right? No need to fake it. James isn't saying, oh, just pretend. Every time something goes wrong, just smile and pretend like everything's all right. That is not what James is saying. No need to, to, to pretend. No, no need to be phony. You, you know people who are like, oh, no, everything's, I, it's just, that's okay. That's, nobody loves difficulty. But joy comes. Hear this. Joy comes. I tried to word this carefully. Joy comes by when we look through trials, not when we look at trials. Joy comes when we look through trials, and we see that this is not the way it's always going to be. God has prepared something greater. Joy comes when we look through trials, not when we look at trials. When we look at trials, uh, it becomes difficult, right? True joy in the midst of a fallen world. That is amazing grace, isn't it? True joy. Well, we can see, we understand, we understand that this is not all there is. Trials do not have the, the last word in our lives, in our existence. God will have the last word. Listen, listen to the words of the writer of Hebrews again. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, speaking about Jesus, said, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him. So... Jesus hung on the cross and smiled and said, isn't this great, right? No, no, that's not what, that's not what the writer of Hebrews says. That's not what John, uh, James is saying. We'd consider it all joy. Jesus was able to see through this, this situation. May I say situation? Um, Jesus, for at least a moment, the God the Son was separated from God the Father for was it the whole three hours that it was dark? Was it just a moment? We don't know. But for the first time in eternity, God the Son was separated from God the Father as he took your sin and my sin upon himself. And in a sense, the Father had to turn his back on the Son. That had never happened in eternity. He did, friend, he did that for you. And I suggest you embrace by faith that act of submission, of surrender that our Lord gave for us. It's not in joy 
There's a difference between enjoying. Jesus did not enjoy the cross. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. There's a difference between enjoying some. Oh, I just enjoy difficult times. I enjoy when people make fun of me. I enjoy when people steal my stuff, whatever. There's a difference between enjoy and true joy that can see through the trial. Does that make sense? True joy that sees through the trial, not just looks at the trial. Living with a sense of life is hard, but God is good. Right? Isn't that, wouldn't that be a banner for us to live by? Life is hard, but God is good. Attitude, attitudes toward trials. There's blame. God, it's your fault or, or, or it's somebody else's fault and you're not doing anything about it. Um, you could do something about it, but you're not able. Attitude of doubt. Oh, you're, you're plenty able, but you're not willing. Attitude of faith. God, I recognize who you are, what you've done. Attitudes toward trials. How about we, here's your homework assignment. How about we walk with him, get to know him, and experience his kindness, his care, his joy. How about we walk with him this week and experience the kindness of the Lord? Experience his joy. Experience the joy that only he can give. And experience his care. The, right, the, the psalmist said this, Psalm 34, verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. How about we taste and see God's goodness? The certainty of trials. They're going to come. We live in a fallen world. Attitudes towards trials. Attitude of blame. Attitude of doubt. An attitude of faith. And third, let's look at the benefits of trials. The benefits of trials. Well, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? The benefits of trials. Verses 3 and 4. For you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, Lacking in nothing. For you know. Speaks of knowledge, understanding. You know, James is saying, hey, you know. You understand. You understand that we live in a fallen world. You understand. You understand the score. The testing of our faith. The testing of our faith. Produces rewards, benefits. Hear me. That are not available anywhere else. The testing of our faith produces benefits, rewards, if you will, that aren't available anywhere else. Again, not pretending that uh, we just enjoy difficulties. I just love tough times. But possessing a worldview that understands the big picture. The big picture is we live in a fallen world. Things are difficult. Our, our health is on the decrease. Uh, Everything in this world is on the decrease. Again, Romans chapter 8, Paul mentions that all of creation groans, longing for that day when he makes all things new. And not only creation, but we ourselves groan within us because we just know things aren't right, right? Not enjoying every hardship, but possessing a worldview that understands the big picture, right? Does that make sense? A worldview that, un that understands the big picture, that we're just passing through here. Yes, things are tough. Jesus' words, very few words, he spell it out. John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Number one, benefit, a couple that he mentions. Trials, they build perseverance. They build perseverance or endurance or steadfastness, my English Standard Version says. They build perseverance. Here's how I think that works. As we are tried, we learn to trust God more, we learn to trust ourselves less, and our faith grows. Right? Let's make it as simple as we can. In the midst of trials, we learn to trust God more. It's a trial after trial, we, we, sometimes we fail, right? We try and trust ourselves. But trial after trial... 
we learn to trust God more, we learn to trust ourselves less, and our faith grows, right? Trial after trial, we see God's faithfulness. We see our own inadequacy, and our faith grows. Does that make sense? Yeah. Trials, they produce perseverance. Perseverance, endurance, steadfastness. It's that staying power, maybe we could call it, that staying power, that stability that sustains us in our walk with God. We learn through trial after trial to trust God more, trust ourselves less, and grow. Grow in that staying power, that stability that allows us not just to make it through in one piece, right? God's not as much interested in making us, allowing us to make it through in one piece, but to come out the other side even stronger. <coughs> Think about the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus said a sower went out scattering seed everywhere. Some of the seed fell on rocky soil where the seed was able to take root, uh, it kind of sp would spring up, and then when the sun in the heat of the day would beat down, it would shrivel. He said that is the person who comes to faith in Christ, and th they grow a little bit of roots, but because the soil is rocky, the, t the troubles of this world beat down and they hang it up. My paraphrase. You have met, met many of those folks. Don't be one of those folks who gets all excited about Jesus. Oh, look what he's got for me. And man, I, I see the, I think I see the big picture. And you start to grow. And then the, the trials, the, the, the temptations, the difficulties of this life beat down and we shrivel up and die. Trials build perseverance. That's staying power. We learn to trust God more. We learn to trust ourselves less. And we grow in our faith. And lastly, trials, they build maturity. They build maturity. Let steadfastness have its full effect. When we grow in steadfastness and perseverance and endurance, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. To me, that, that points to maturity. That spells out maturity. Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 48, after teaching about, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's taught about faithfulness and marriage and giving and praying and uh, making good on your promises and a number of things. After all that, Jesus said, and Verse 48 of Matthew 5, be perfect. Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you say, what? <laughs> perfect. No, no, I didn't sign up for that. I mean, I wish I could, but I didn't think that course was available. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That word there means it's not sinless perfection. That, that's, that's where we're headed, but it means completeness, wholeness. Only other time that that Greek word is mentioned in the New Testament is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Listen to how, how Paul closes this first letter to the church at Thessalonica, Thessalonica excuse me, verse 23 of, of chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. There's that word. Sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you be completed, mature, mature, seeing difficulties of this life with a mature heart that says, I see the big picture here. No, I don't like this. I'm going to pray this thing out of here, but I understand that in this life we have troubles, right? This completeness, a maturity that only comes, really only comes, through difficult, if we didn't have any difficulties in life, our, our faith would be that shallow, right? We'd never need to trust God. We just, we just trust everything's going to work out just fine. If we didn't have trials, trials produce perseverance. Perseverance produces maturity. So you say, well, you know, I didn't sign up for maturity. That's an immature statement. 
right? Yeah, we, we get, I didn't sign up for maturity. You see people like, I didn't sign up for this. Ah, I see your immaturity. I see that in me. Maybe you see that in you. Yeah, I don't want trials. I'm fine without perseverance, and I'm really fine without maturity. Yeah, that's a super immature statement. And it reveals our hearts. The spiritual maturity, this completeness, this perfection, and that word, we just, that just blows our mind, but this completeness, uh, it, it's a goal. The difference between the goal and, and reality. Reality is none of us have arrived yet, right? None of us have arrived yet. We will one day. But none of us have arrived yet, so when trials come, God, I'm going to trust you more this time than I did last time. I'm going to trust myself uh, less than I did last time, and I want to grow. We should all be striving toward the goal, right? Regardless of where you're at in reality, I, keep, I just fail daily. Fine, that's where you're at. And let, let trials, let difficulties have their result that you would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. That's a statement to believers in this world who are struggling, they're fearful, uh, no doubt are confused, they've been scattered, persecution is ramping up, they don't know what lies ahead. They're puzzled as why things are the way they are. We're in the same boat. And James says to them, oh, that you would grow from trials. Grow from the trials. I mentioned, I entitled this message, From Trial to Triumph. You can triumph in this life, not just one day in heaven, you can triumph in this life, being, have, have, lacking in nothing. Hear this, when our faith is intact and growing, when our faith is intact and growing, what else do we need? And I mean that sincerely, really. When our faith is intact and growing, what else do we need? Oh, well, I need a lot more money, and I need a lot better job, and I need a lot better this and that, and I need better health. You know what? You had all those things, and if it's not well with your soul, it still wouldn't be well with your soul. When our faith is intact and growing, what else do we need? And I leave that. I know that's mind-boggling, but I believe that to be true. Our faith is intact and growing. What else do we need? Well, we can list a whole bunch of things that we would want. If we had all of those things and our faith wasn't growing, we wouldn't be any better off. Truly, we wouldn't be at the core. We would not be any, any better off than we are today. Because nothing, nothing is more precious. Nothing is more valuable than our faith in, in what God has done in Christ. Nothing is more valuable. Well, yeah, I got that. I want everything else. No, if we're not growing, if we're not growing in our faith, then we're missing it. And James is laying out here for us as he begins this letter. Did I mention he didn't like spend a whole lot of time saying, hey, guys, how you doing? And how's Joe? And he just right to the point. Hey, I want to get to the point. Count it all joy. Can you imagine reading this letter for the first time? You've been separated from your homeland, many of your friends. You don't know what's going on. Hey, consider it a, just a wonderful blessing because you're going through tough times. But he lays out for them. You can grow. You can grow in your perseverance. You can grow in your maturity. Again, I don't want maturity. That's a sign of our own immaturity. Benefits of trials. They build perseverance. They build maturity. I want to close with this. One last thing to chew on. Because there's a whole lot in these four verses to chew on, isn't there? Like a whole lot. Been a whole lot easier if James just started with, boy, Jesus sure does love you and thinks you're just the bomb diggity. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, hey, trials are a great thing, and you can grow by them. <coughs> Rut row. Uh, the, the trials of life either consume us. I, I chose my words carefully. I think the trials of life either consume us or they will refine us. The choice is ours. The trials of life, the difficulties of life will either consume us. That's all we see and we're just fretting about why is this happening? Why is that happening? The trials of life either, either consume us or they will refine us. I think that's what James is talking about, isn't he? It's our choice. Are we going to let 
the difficulties of life, and they are sure and they are many. They come fast and furious. Are we going to let them consume us? Are we going to let them refine us? I want to leave us with this simple conclusion. Trials are a fact that can't be avoided. Period. Full stop. Trials are a fact that can't be avoided. But maturity is a choice that shouldn't be avoided. We ought to seek to grow. Say, I want to grow without difficulty. Like your favorite football team wants to win the Super Bowl without practicing. It's not going to happen, right? May God, may God teach us to trust him more and to trust ourselves less and to grow through the difficulties of life. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We dare, we dare pray this morning. Father, thank you for the difficult things in life because they do indeed point to Eternal glory, they point to the fact that this is not how things are always going to be. Father, as we face difficulties, the difficulties that are coming up in our minds even right now, even right now, difficult situations, things that drive us nuts. Father, can we, can we have a joy deep on the inside, not a, not a happy facade, but a joy, a well-being of soul in the midst of our hearts, knowing the big picture, what you have done for us, that you have overcome this world, that this is not the way things are always going to be. Father, may we be mature enough, may we be complete, perfect enough to see the big picture, to see that the trials of this life are just the results of fallen humanity. The things people say to us, do to us, are simply a result of fallen humanity. Father, can we see right through that to your glory? to your provision? Can we see your promises highlighted over the biggest difficulties we face in life? Can we see your promises through the trials that we face? Father, would you? Would you grace us with a visitation of your spirit that would allow us to see the big picture, that we can rejoice in the midst of difficult times because we know we know who wins. We know what you've accomplished. Yeah. We know your goodness. We know your goodness. Father, you are a good, good Father. May we, never, may we never blame you for the difficulties of this life. May we never doubt that you are fully in control, fully sovereign. May we put our faith in you afresh. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand?